Design practice is evolving in some surprising and even radical ways. One emerging approach is called biodesign, and it involves going out into nature and trying to include biology into design processes and the finished product. One representative example is this footbridge grown and constructed near Lake Constance in Germany. It's supported by living willow trees. And a work like this, which blurs the line between what is built and what is in the environment, also creates a foothold for numerous species, from birds and insects to the microorganisms in the soil. A tower by the same researchers from the University of Stuttgart also works to create incentives where none exist today. Um, the, imagine the owners of this land or the users of this architecture now have a vested interest to maintain clean air, soil, and water, the conditions needed for those trees to flourish. But of course, working with living matter is nothing entirely new. Uh, five, as long ago as 500 years ago, uh, people in the northeastern region of India called Meghalaya have been growing these root bridges that uh, take quite a lot of time and patience, but the, uh, the root systems of these trees are guided over the rivers. And this becomes important for the community because for hundreds of years they've lacked conventional uh, construction technologies, and uh, it's one of the wettest places on Earth, receiving more than 1,200 centimeters of rain a year. So at any given time, uh, water flows become very quick and violent. And then a more contemporary example, this is uh, Bosco Verticale, or a series of towers that's a vertical forest, being constructed today in Milan. When finished, it'll, it will feature more than a thousand trees around the uh, facades of the two towers, introducing to an urban space that's mostly barren, a tremendous amount of biological matter and generating what I like to think of as ecological profit. But why is this kind of approach uh, maybe seeming alien? I think in part because our starting point for understanding architecture, our expectations, are rooted in buildings like this one, the Seagram Building uh, in New York, constructed in 1958 and designed by Mies van der Rohe. It's thought of by many people as one of the greatest buildings of the 20th century. It's a kind of epi the epitome of the aesthetic inspired by the machine, of creating the, the black cube or the white cube that has precise dimensions and, very importantly, is controlled and hygienic. And when we construct like this, there are big trade-offs. One of them for this particular building is terrible energy efficiency. Uh, in a recent analysis, it was revealed that it's one of the worst performing buildings in the whole of New York City. Yet we still, you know, we may have moved on to postmodernism or other forms that are less boxy than the Seagram building, but I think the reflex to control and, and sanitize space is still dominant. And part of that reason is our human, uh, the legacy of human history. Our ancestors suffered and died at the hands of biology for so many generations, through disease, through germs, through infection. Um, think back only to uh, less than 100 years ago, 50 million people died from the Spanish flu. At the time, that was like 3% of the world's population. And of course, the threats of these kinds of diseases have, have dwindled, but the legacy in our psyche is still quite strong. Think about the germ theory of disease, the understanding of how these things work. This is only a late 19th century, early 20th century phenomenon. And then the availability of commercial antibiotics is only from the 1930s. So it's no wonder we're reluctant to invite life into our spaces, into our everyday processes, especially the invisible sort. But that's changing, thanks in part to biomedical science, which is revealing that we are all very complex, diverse ecosystems in miniature. In fact, what we think of as our bodies consists of roughly 100 trillion cells, and only 10 trillion of them are human. The rest, the full 90%, are a mix of bacteria, fungi, viruses, and we're discovering that we rely on so many of those processes and those, um, those microorganisms for the maintenance of our immune system, for digestion, and perhaps many other functions that we're sort of discovering, um, it seems, month by month. Now, how does this relate back to design? To tell that story, it's useful to look at the history of the material concrete. First used in a big way by the Romans, of course, it was an important ingredient 
in the infrastructure of the empire, used to make bridges, barracks, aqueducts, and roads, as well as structures like this one, the Great Pantheon in Rome, which still to this day features the world's biggest unreinforced poured concrete dome. But while the dome still stands, of course, the empire fell. And for 13 centuries following that, the formula for making concrete was lost, or at least virtually lost. There were a few isolated pockets where the construction continued, but it only returned in any significant way into usage at the time and place of the Industrial Revolution, mid-18th century Great Britain. And it was less than 100 years after that when we learned how to reinforce concrete using rebar or iron bars to give the material tensile strength. This vastly grew the possibilities of building with concrete, and we used it for things like uh, construction like the Aqueduct de Lavant in Paris, uh, designed by Francois Quanet. This kind of structure, you can also think, was in response to what was happening at the time, mid-19th century, mass urbanization all across Europe, and a growing population. Also, a big force of the time, of course, was the intense competition among nation states in the form of colonialism and the beginnings of global trade. This is the uh, lighthouse built at, the, at Port Said in Egypt at the mouth of the Suez Canal. It was finished in 1869, and I think no big coincidence that in less than 20 years after its construction, the entire country fell under British imperial control. But now we're experimenting with reinforcing concrete in a different way. What you're seeing here is a sample of bioconcrete, and this kind of research is happening at a few different uh, universities, one of them not far from here uh, at TU Delft, and the idea is to embed a particular specialized kind of bacteria in the material. It lies dormant for uh, a few years. Once the material naturally degrades, it wears and tears, and a small crack emerges. What that does is it admits a little bit of moisture and air. That prompts these little uh, microbes inside to reanimate and begin secreting limestone, in effect sealing the crack. Now, why is this important? Well, concrete is so essential to construction, to our infrastructure. It's also a really dirty technology, ecologically speaking. Roughly for every ton of concrete we make, we produce a ton of carbon and release it into the atmosphere. So any kind of work like this, if it can be perfected and scaled up, might have a huge impact. That's positive. Other ways that we're using biology very cleverly, this is research uh, done at a uh, research center called CASE in uh, New York State, and it's called a phytoremediation system, which is just a kind of complicated way of saying an air purification system using plants. And in these modules you see, very kind of simply, they contain a low-powered fan and plants with exposed root systems. And the fan blows air over those root systems, which have all this surface area on which live millions of microorganisms that are living with the plant symbiotically. They have the special property of being able to absorb and safely metabolize uh, particulates from the air and volatile organic compounds that would be harmful to human health. What's significant about this is that the way this is normally achieved in a building is through conventional mechanical ventilation systems and filtration systems, which are um, huge drains of energy on a building. And another solution, uh, using the root systems of mushrooms to make packaging. This is from Ecovative Design, um, also from the States. And uh, what they're doing is basically creating molds where the root systems of mushrooms can grow. And then over a course of a few days, the, those, uh, that growth hardens into a kind of material that is competitive with styrofoam. So this is an all-natural alternative to a synthetic. And what's so great about it is that after its use, which if you think about it, when you receive packaging, it only lasts for a second, right? You throw it right away. You can put it right back into the environment, into your yard, your compost, and it will safely re-enter uh, re the environment, unlike styrofoam, which will sit in the landfill for hundreds of years. And another example on the architectural scale, this is the BIQ building, or the Algae House, recently opened in Hamburg. It's a residential structure that features a shell of panels along the outside in which are growing algae. These algae will, uh, are periodically harvested, they're brought off-site, they're fermented into biofuel, and they're burned. That electricity uh, helps to uh, make this building energy independent. And then back to the industrial design scale, this moss table uh, by researchers at the University of Cambridge 
in the UK use very simple common moss uh, in a table and light that work together. So they're taking advantage of the symbiotic relationship between the mosses and the bacteria that live in the soil right beneath. Their interaction releases a slow but steady stream of charged particles. Those can be uh, gathered, directed together, and help to power a small appliance like a light. And then a little bit closer to home, um, this work called Snails by Liska Schrader utilizes the digestive tracts of snails to create a unique biomaterial. Uh, in these little farms, the snails are fed colored paper, and then their poop takes on the color of uh, that material. This is gathered and ground together and can make uh, decorative tiles and some other applications. What I like so much about a work like this is not so much that these tiles are going to um, upend the international tile industry anytime soon. They probably won't. But for every project like this that uses something that's so non-threatening, right? A snail moves slowly. You can see it in the garden. You can order it in a restaurant. It's uh, not scary to us. So for every project like this, the idea of using bacteria in concrete or algae in a building, I think, becomes a little bit more acceptable. Now, how far can we take this? I think it can go on and on, and I hope that we, we continue to do this, but in a way that's less exploitive and more uh, respectful of biological systems. After all, they are more, many times more sophisticated and complex than even our most advanced digital technologies. And yet there's more complications and things to be worried about. In the near future, it's getting, uh, right now really, it's becoming possible uh, to easily alter organisms at the level of DNA. What you're glimpsing here is the falling price of gene synthesis and sequencing over the last few years. This is very analogous to the falling price of steel at the end of the 19th century and the falling price of computer power at the end of the 20th. And it will undoubtedly unleash this explosion of opportunities to productize biology, to alter species in all kinds of ways that I hope we do responsibly. But we've seen already, apart from genetically modified crops are applications like this, the glowfish, which you probably can't buy here in Europe, but you can buy them in the States. And then looking ahead even further, um, sometimes it's helpful to um, see the visions of artists. This set of works is by Vincent Fournier uh, from France, and it's called Post-Natural History, and it tries to visualize animals that we might uh, design in the near future using, or 50, 100 years from now, using synthetic biology, and so that they have special characteristics. They're like chimeras of multiple species, and they are adapted to a vastly changed climate, which we're now creating, or satisfy some new human needs. And this is a collection of uh, those works. And in these kind of visions, some of them are dark. I maintain my optimism. I feel like I am informed, I know that human beings eventually misuse every technology we get our hands on. But I'm optimistic that with presentations like this, with education, with public engagement through activities like exhibitions, we can ensure that this type of bio-designing has benefits that far outweigh any costs or unintended consequences. Thank you very much.